Welcome to this course on philosophy of education. My name is Stephen Hicks. I'm a professor of philosophy. And one of my very strong areas of academic and professional interest is education. In this course in philosophy of education, a good place to start is with two natural questions. Uh, what is education? Uh, what is philosophy? And then a third follow-up question, what does philosophy have to do with education? Now, in this course, we're not going to presuppose uh, extensive background knowledge in educational theory and practice, uh, nor are we going to presuppose extensive background knowledge in philosophy, so we can start uh, at the beginning, so to speak. So, with that in mind, let's uh, go to the board here, where I have the, the title of the course, uh, Philosophy of Education, written down, and start with uh, those two questions. First, education. Uh, what is this? If we were to try to define it, or come up with an explanatory descriptor of sentence uh, in the first place, how would we go about doing so? Well, we might start by brainstorming the kinds of things that come to mind when we think about education. Certainly, we start to think about knowledge. So we can write that down. We uh, might think about skills right, that uh, operationalize or so put the, uh, the knowledge into practice. Uh, we, uh, in a social setting, know that there is uh, a student. Usually the student is a younger person. Uh, if it's a social activity, the person is not self-taught or, uh, or an autodidact. There's typically a teacher, right, uh, an instructor who is uh, guiding the person right through the, uh, through the process. It is a process. Uh, might be an important concept here. Typically it's a, a, a longer process. Um, starting with younger people, typically the teachers are older peer people who are, are more experienced, but at a certain point we want the students not to be uh, under the tutelage of a teacher anymore, that we're trying to uh, transform the, the, the students into uh, adults who, uh, uh, once they've finished their formal schooling and their formal education, can go forth and live their, their lives more independently. They may be uh, lifelong learners, of course, but uh, uh, that's not primarily what the educational process uh, is, is about. Okay, now suppose we then tried to put all of this uh, together in a definition. We say, all right, here is education. All right, definition. It's a uh, process of learning. and teaching, primarily the young, the knowledge and skills necessary for adult life. All right, good starting point. Uh, points of controversy that uh, are, uh, are, are worth raising questions about here. Uh, we know that, of course, older people can be uh, educated as well. Some people will come back for a second educational career. Uh, so do we need to expand the definition in that category? We know that there are people who are self-taught. Uh, so is the teaching part necessary here? We've mentioned knowledge uh, and skills. Uh, are there other things that we need to add? Do we, for example, talk about character? Uh, is that something that we essentially should add? So in various ways, we could have a discussion and debate about the exact scope and application of this particular definition. But I'm going to use this uh, as an initial good starting point for introducing education in its connection to philosophy. We have enough to go on to get that on the board. We can take this uh, initial definition as uh, serving generically for any species uh, uh, in the development of which the young have a process of learning before they are ready to function fully as adults of whatever type of species uh, that they are. 
Of course, most plants, they don't have any learning component. Uh, other species, perhaps like uh, insects and uh, fish, at most will have a minimal amount of learning uh, that they engage in in their lives before they're fully functioning adults. For more complicated species, though, it may be a matter of a season. Uh, cats, for example, might be born in the spring, learn over the course of several months as they are growing into adult cats, and then by the fall uh, uh, come to sexual maturity and know everything that they need to know to function as adult cats. Dogs typically are a little bit longer. Dolphins, chimpanzees, and elephants, complicated species like that. Their maturity is a longer process, a matter of many years. But even in the case of those more complicated animals, the amount of actual learning and education that they need to uh, acquire in order to be able to function as adults in that species is, is uh, much less than the amount uh, of time that human beings engage in. Uh, their education. So that points up, I think, one important philosophically charged fact about human education that I want to draw our attention to at the outset, and that is the length of time that we as human beings devote to this process of education. Uh, by the time, for example, even if we take as a baseline puberty, we'll say here biologically and hopefully psychologically, uh, a young human being is going through the process of becoming an adult human being. That is uh, 12 to 13 years uh, on average. And so the idea is that childhood uh, being a process of, of a dozen years or more and that the primary thing that the student should be engaged in or that the young person should be engaged in at that point is being a student or learning the things that he or she needs to be able to function right, as, a, as a human being. That is an enormous uh, investment in, uh, in time. Um, the other important thing and I think the distinctive thing about human education is that we engage in the process systematically. Right? So I'm going to use an abstract noun, systematicity. In the other animal species, even those other animal species for which there is an extended learning period before the, uh, the, 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 the young animal becomes an adult, the educational process is largely a matter of hit or miss. Right? When an, uh, an opportunity arises for, the, say, the mother wolf to teach the young cub a lesson in hunting, then a hunting lesson will ensue. Right, or any sort of other lesson uh, that, that arises. But it's more opportunistic and over the course in a helter-skelter kind of fashion that the young animal will be exposed to the kinds of things that he or she needs to know uh, in order to function as an adult. When we as human beings do our education, the education of our young, we don't do it helter-skelter. Uh, for the most part, we shouldn't be doing it, and uh, we don't do it that way. We think about what we're doing. We're thinking systematically in the following sense. We want the students to know these things, these things, these things, and so forth. And we come up with a hopefully thoroughly itemized list of all of the things that we want the student to know, all of the skills that we want the person to know, the character traits, if we include character traits uh, uh, that we want the students to know. We attend to various developmental issues. Students uh, can't be exposed to these things before they've learned these things, and they can't learn these things before they've learned these things. And so we're thinking about this long process over the course of many years, and we're setting up the process at the beginning to set up for the middle, to set up for the, uh, the ultimate and penultimate parts of the, the processes. And so the idea then is that we're developing systems right, of education, and then we bring the students into that system, right, so to speak. Third feature I want to emphasize is the amount of, not time that we invest in the process, but the amount of wealth that we as human beings uh, invest in the process. Particularly as we culturally become wealthier, we start to devote systematically more resources, both time resources and monetary resources, to the process of education. Uh, typically, uh, any family that is moving from a state of poverty to a state of not being in poverty, they start to acquire uh, things that used to be luxuries in their lives, almost without exception. One of the first luxuries that parents invest in is more education for their children, more books, more schooling, more soccer lessons, more piano lessons, and, uh, and so forth. And we can also track this across cultures. Uh, uh, the, the amount of money that we invest and the amount of time that we invest goes up proportionally 
disproportionately as our cultures become older. For example, uh, I can recall in my grandparents' generation, uh, they were getting their education in the first part of the 20th century. The standard for them, uh, particularly in my family, my last name is Hicks, so you might make a judgment from there, an accurate judgment that I come from a long line of farmers. Uh, but there, the standard education, uh, that which was thought to be proficient preparation for adult life was to get up to about eighth grade education. And once you got your eighth grade diploma, you needed basically everything you needed to in, or in order to be able to function efficiently and productively as a farmer in that, uh, that particular culture. Now that in historical time is already a um, major investment of both wealth resources and time resources in the early part of the 20th century. By the time we get to, say, my parents' generation, the expectations has changed. Uh, the culture was wealthier by the time we got to the middle part of the 20th century when my parents were getting their education. And their eighth grade education was no longer considered to be uh, sufficient. Everybody was expected to give uh, high school a try. And there started to be a, a stigma attached to being a high school dropout, right, so to speak. So high school graduation uh, is then the new standard. And uh, we're willing to make the wealth commitment and the amount of time commitment. And so we're not expecting students to be fully functioning adults by the time they're 13 or 14. Instead, we're expecting them to be fully functional adults by the time they are 17 or 18. By the time we get to my education, getting my education in the latter part of the 20th century, again, the culture is wealthier, uh, the society is more complicated, uh, we are going to also afford to have an extended childhood, but there the expectations uh, changed and the expectation was that people of my uh, generation, everybody, should give uh, college a try. Uh, now, my understanding is that by the early part of the 20th century, only about 23 to 25 percent of the uh, adult Canadian and American population has a college degree, but the new aspiration is being uh, set that uh, giving college is a try. And now as we're getting into the 21st century in the wealthy countries, going on for graduate school to get a professional degree or a PhD is also something that we're encouraging more systematically and, and more broadly. Now, the point then is if you put all of these three together. The length of time that we as human beings investigate, or invest rather, in education, the systematic process that we are engaging in, and the amount of wealth that we are asking ourselves and other people to uh, spend on this particular problem, this bears thinking upon. So if this is what we're doing, and we say, for example, by the time we're in our generation, college graduates, a student is uh, 22 years or so for the first 22 years of this person's life. We want their primary focus to be on education and, of course, maybe having a part-time job here and there doing their chores and having lots of time for fun, but primarily their project is the educational process of learning to be a fully functional adult. What are we doing right, that warrants that enormous expenditure of wealth? What are we doing such that we are investing 22 years of that child's life? And what system? Uh, are we going to put in place that warrants that amount of wealth being spent and that amount of time being put? To the, time, to the extent that we start then thinking about those questions, we're necessarily going to bump into philosophical questions. We start to think strategically in terms of the big picture of education. Anytime you start to think strategically and big picture about anything, you're entering the territory of philosophy, and that'll be my next topic. What's this got to do with philosophy? All right, so I've uh, rewritten the initial definition of education up in the right-hand corner in order to make more room here. Start making connections to uh, this as a statement of the educational uh, goal to philosophy. I want to uh, develop an analogy to uh, a production line. Suppose we think of a, a factory where uh, your, your job is to make something or other. Uh, if you're going to do your job well, then there are certain things that are absolutely necessary. You have to have, obviously have a clear conception of what it is that you're trying to produce. You also have to have a clear conception of what your initial raw materials are, what they're capable of, and then you have to have a process, uh, a central process that takes those raw materials and systematically transforms them in, uh, in such a fashion so that you get the desired output, right, so to speak. So I'm going to put a, uh, a production line abstractly right on the, on the board here and say this is at the beginning of the process we have an input. We have some sort of raw materials, right, that are coming in. 
And then uh, we have some conception of an output at the end of the process, or what it is that we want to, uh, to come out. And then in the middle here we have right, production. Okay. So we take the raw materials, we do various sorts of productive things with them, to them, or on their behalf, and then at the end of the result we have the desired output and it's off and running. Now let's draw the analogy crudely to, uh, to education. In the case of uh, education, our input is going to be someone who is young, right? a youngster, right? a child. Right? At some point, the person comes into the, the formal educational system. We then work with the student, uh, on the student, uh, and so forth, whatever verbs are appropriate at this point, through a long process that we call the process of education. Right? And what we're trying to produce uh, is an educated youngster who at the end of the process is an adult. Now, I want to add just a few more clarifying things. Obviously, at the beginning, we're talking in our context about a young human being. Okay. So the first thing we have to do is understand, as anybody in any productive field, understand what our raw material is. So uh, we have young human being coming into the process as raw material. What am I dealing with in my, if I'm a teacher? I'm a kindergarten teacher. I've got 15 or 20 of them show up in my classroom on day one of the new school year. Uh, what am I dealing with? What uh, kinds of beings uh, have I here? What are their capacities? What uh, can I expect of them? And so forth. Well, so we start saying things like the following. Well, young human beings, we know, they have uh, certain needs. So we might start to brainstorm various kinds of needs that they have. And certainly they have uh, various uh, nutrition needs. Right, they can go for a certain amount of time and then they need to have a, a, a snack right, of something like that or perhaps lunch. Uh, and that is a, a physical need. So we can use the symbol phi for things physical in this context here. So one need they have is a nutrition need. It might be the case that they can go for a certain amount of time and then they need to take a break. So they might have a point at which they need to have a little nap. Right, or, or take a break of some other need. Uh, in addition to having various uh, straightforward physical needs, they're more complicated being, they have psychological needs. And I'll use the Greek symbol psi here for the psychological. They have uh, curiosity needs, and so they might need certain sorts of stimulus. Otherwise, they get bored and they tune various things out. Uh, they might have uh, various uh, needs for comfort. Uh, if they get overwhelmed by certain amounts of tier of material, and so uh, they might have a, an emotional need right, for comfort right, at, a, at a certain point. We can also specify their capacities. We know, for example, if they are four or five years old, right, then physically they, on average, have a certain amount of strength. Right? We can expect them to be able to lift something, say, I'm just making this number up, up to 10 pounds, but they do not have the physical capacity to lift things that are 50 pounds or, or 100 pounds. So we should be attentive in any sort of physical thing that we're asking them to do to whatever their, their, uh, their strengths are in this case. Or they might have uh, various kinds of dexterity. Right? They might be able to manipulate certain objects with their hands. Right? Can they hold a pencil or pen uh, in, in such a way as to be able to, to, uh, to write letters and so forth. That would be something that we would need to know uh, if we're going to, uh, uh, to, to educate them. And we also know that they have certain uh, psychological capacities that would be important here. They do have a capacity for a certain amount of abstract thought. Right, they have a fairly well-developed vocabulary by the time they're four or five years old. But nonetheless, they're not yet ready for abstract algebra, let alone uh, uh, calculus. So we have to uh, f figure things out uh, at appropriate capacity level here. And we also know that they may have a certain amount of emotional uh, resilience, say. Right, they are 
know, dealing with uh, challenging issues, new circumstances, uh, a certain amount of failures and disappointments, but they can bounce back under certain circumstances uh, emotionally, but that capacity is not unlimited at the age of five. So what we then are doing is developing a kind of chart here. What are the needs of the, of, of the young human being, both physically and psychologically? What capacities does that human being have, uh, uh, both again, psychologically and uh, uh, um, physically? Now, at the beginning of the process, then, having all of this worked out is going to be absolutely important for the teacher. Another important thing is for a teacher to know is that all of these things are developmental. Right. Even uh, for students in the at, the at the beginning of age five compared to students at the end of age five, that's a hugely uh, important developmental year. A lot can transform itself, uh, and so we need to be sensitive to the individual's developmental path as well as knowing in general what the averages are, what we can expect developmentally from four-year-olds, five-year-olds, and uh, on the, up through the process um, as well. So. None of this by itself is especially philosophical. Uh, I think part of teacher training or part of being able to do uh, education professionally involves knowing all of this stuff, but the more directly relevant fields of inquiry that are, uh, uh, are important here, I think, are going to be, of course, biology, human biology, human developmental biology, and so part of professional teacher training and ongoing teacher professionalism is keeping up with what we are learning, and we're learning a lot on a regular basis, continuously in, in developmental biology as it bears on the age-appropriate uh, uh, material uh, for, for the students that we will be dealing with. Also, the same can be said for psychology. Young human beings are very complicated psychological beings as well. And so keeping up with and knowing a great deal about uh, child psychology and developmental psychology is an important part of the teacher's uh, training and ongoing professional practice. So biology and psychology, so we have a very clear sense of what our raw material is uh, at the beginning of the process. Okay, good. Now, we're at the beginning of the process. In order to know also what we're going to be doing with the young human beings at that age, we should have a clear sense of what our goal is. All right, so we know at the end of the educational process, we will graduate the student, we'll put our stamp of approval on, we'll give the student a diploma and say, you are now ready to go forth uh, uh, as an adult. Uh, we have outputted uh, uh, our production from, from our educational system here. What is it that we are trying to produce here? Well, again, some qualifiers are, are important here. We are, as human beings, we are educating adult human beings. And we want those adult human beings, by the time they're finished the educational process, to be capable of functioning. Uh, all of their capacities that we think need to be developed, need to be developed. All of the functions that they're going to need to be able to do as adult human beings, they need to be in a position to be able to do all of those functions. And I'm going to add one more uh, qualifier here right, in the real world okay. philosophically charged term right there. But I'm adding this because partly childhood, in particular childhood in school, we say things to students like, wait till you're out in the real world. Of course, they are in the real world uh, already. Uh, school is, is part of reality, and they're dealing with real human beings and real situations. So childhood is part of real life, all, all to speak. But nonetheless, what I think is captured uh, here by saying that adult life is uh, taking on the, the real world as opposed to school life is that when children are still children, they do to some extent live in a buffered reality or an insulated reality. Parents and, uh, and teachers, when the children are in school, do take some pains to insulate students from having to take on reality full bore because we know that they're not yet fully able to do so. So it is a, a, a less of a full contact with the real world. But nonetheless, the expectation is by the time one is an adult, those buffers go come off, the insulating uh, comes off, and one takes on reality without parents and teachers being the intermediaries rather between you and the real world. All right, now that said, I want to uh, 
tease out some philosophical implications, and I think there are several right at this point here. I suppose just in this formulation, our goal is to produce adult human beings who are capable of functioning in the real world. I'm just going to isolate here two words, human beings. And now I ask the question, what is it to be a human being? What is that? All right, what is it to be a fully developed human being? What is our conception of that? What makes me, me? What makes you, you? What makes all of us, right, as human beings, human beings? What's distinctive about us? What's important about us? Uh, what's essential to being the kinds of being that we are? Now, that's a hard question. There have been lots of different answers uh, given to it. Uh, it's a hard question, partly because we're a very complicated kind of being, and so uh, a full answer to that question necessarily has to be very complicated. But if, out of all of the complicating things that make us us, which of them seem to be most distinctively important to our being the kinds of beings that we are? Let me give you one answer to this question. One thing we can say is important to being a human being is that we are very smart. Right? We have a big brain, we have a powerful mind, we have a capacity of reason. Now, of course, there's some controversy in animal uh, psychology circles over whether other animal species, perhaps chimpanzees or dolphins, also have a capacity for reason. Uh, I'm not going to weigh in on that debate, but nonetheless, a uh, true and obvious thing, an important thing about human beings is that we have, whether those other animal species have reason or not, an extraordinarily powerful Right, rational capacity. Right? We can think very abstractly, and our ability to think very abstractly, very generically, and to reason our way in the world is an important part of our uh, functioning as human beings. We are, for example, physically uh, not very hardy. Right? The temperature gets a little bit hot, we start getting whiny about how hot and humid it is. It gets a little bit cooler, and again, we start whining as well. There's a fairly limited temperature range within which we can function as human beings. Nonetheless, because we are smart, we, are, uh, we have the power of reason, we can devise clothing, we can devise shelters, we can devise central air conditioning and central heating systems to, uh, to compensate and overcome our, our lack of physical hardiness. We're not particularly strong. Uh, even if you take the most powerful human being, weightlifter, uh, and uh, uh, he or she is not particularly muscularly strong. The average chimpanzee, for example, my understanding is, is at least six or seven times as strong as the most strong uh, adult human being. So we don't survive, for example, by wrestling our prey into the ground and ripping it limb from limb or, 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 or using powerful jaws to, uh, to rip food from it. Rather, we're smart, right? We can outsmart prey animals. We can develop farming and all sorts of very complicated uh, food production uh, techniques. Uh, and, and as a result, we can uh, overcome, again, our, our rather frail physiques compared to other animal species. Again, we're not particularly fast, right? The world record holder in the 100 meters uh, is very fast by human standards, but by most other animal species uh, standards, he is not very fast at all. And so it's not the case, again, if we just focus on food issues, that we're going to survive very effectively if it's a matter of being swifter than the kinds of prey that we uh, would like to, uh, to be able to eat. So we could say, for example, just at a very basic biological level, our being able to survive in the sense of putting food on the table, uh, uh, our reason is very important to, to whom we are. But beyond that, so simple putting food on the table issues, our reason is very importantly explanatory for huge parts of our lives. Because we are rational beings, we think abstractly, we can think in terms of abstract cause and effect and start to understand the world around us more theoretically. We can go on to do scientific enterprises, and this gives us a great deal of rational power uh, and existential power over our lives. We can think about uh, the world in the past, and we have strong historical memory, and we can use reason to probe further and further into the past. We can use our theoretical understanding of the world, uh, including our, our, our cause and effect understanding, to think about the future. So we are beings for whom the past is important to us, uh, the future is important to us, uh, as well, of course, the present being uh, important to us, but we are not species who live 
only in the present or, or only with a very limited time sensibility. We're also beings that, uh, as a result of our rational capacity, enjoy art. We enjoy painting and sculpture and literature and theater and music uh, and so forth. We do philosophy, we understand jokes and so forth. All of these important things about who we are, we can then say is a result of our being rational beings. All right, so that's one possible answer. We could then say an implication of this for the educational process is this is the right answer or is the, the essential answer or the core answer to the question what it is to be a human being, then that primarily what we should be doing in the educational process is taking young human beings and doing lots of things with them but primarily developing their rational capacity the rational capacity being the most important capacity that they have to have fully developed and functional if they're going to survive as adult human beings. All right, so that's a philosophical question. What is a human being? A human being is essentially defined by reason. That kind of answer has certain kinds of uh, important educational implications. Now, one of the themes of this course, though, will be that everything is controversial. Uh, in philosophy, and as a result of that, uh, everything in educational practice is going to be con uh, controversial because different philosophical uh, uh, answers are going to dictate very different educational practices. So I want to go back to this question again, and suppose we said, all right, fine, we can understand that, but what else might we say is a true or an important answer to the question what it is to be a human being? Well, another way we can distinguish ourselves is in terms of our emotional capacity. Again, there's a lively debate in uh, animal psychology circles over whether some other animal species have emotions. Uh, I am tentatively on the side of saying that some animal species do have uh, uh, emotions, uh, but I'm not an expert in this area, so I'm not going to pronounce definitively here. But my, I think the most gung-ho advocate of animal emotional experience would uh, at, at, at most say that uh, dogs or dolphins and so forth have, say, a half a dozen or ten at the most emotions that they are capable of experiencing. Certain kinds of affection, certain kinds of fear, certain kinds of anger, right, and so forth. We then would be able to count on the, f on the fingers of one or two hands a number of emotions that are, are uh, experienceable by, by any other animal species. Now, if we look at human beings in that light, an obvious fact about ourselves that we know introspectively and certainly from observing other human beings is that the range of emotions that we are capable of experiencing and the intensity of those emotions uh, that we are capable of experiencing seems to vastly outstrip the emotional experience of any other uh, type of animal. We can experience joy and pride, right, and humility and schadenfreude and nostalgia and uh, melancholy and so forth. You go to uh, any standard emotions chapter in a psychology textbook and just start to count the number of emotions that, uh, that the psychologist there will be talking about, the, the, the number really is staggering. Or, uh, without having to do that kind of research, music, I think, is an important phenomenon here. If you were to consider your own musical collection and just to pick out of that, say, 100 songs, and play all of those songs and then make careful note of the number of emotions that you experience in the course of listening to those songs, the list of emotions would run to several pages, I am, uh, I am quite sure. So one thing that we can then say is, uh, another possible answer to this question is that important to our identity as human beings is our emotions. That what we want adult human beings to be able to do, to live a full life, to live the best possible kind of life, is to experience the full range uh, of intense emotional experience that makes human life, life, uh, life possible. Uh, and we also want human beings to be able to have the emotional resilience and the emotional strength to be able to live right, that sort of a, sort of a life. So we want to, uh, to achieve happiness, we want to experience all of the intense emotionality that our family relationships can bring to us, our business achievements can bring to us, our friendships can bring to us, our romantic lives can bring to us, our accomplishments in sporting activities, and so forth. Uh, literature is intentionally emotional and certainly music, as I've just mentioned, is as well. So that then, if we give that as a key answer to the question, what it is that makes human beings, the, importantly, the kinds of beings that they are, that we focus on our emotional capacities, that then will have implications for what we're doing in education. We then would give a 
different emphasis to our educational system, arguing that what we should be doing is preparing human beings to experience the full range of human emotion uh, and to have the full re uh, emotional resilience uh, to be able to have the right kinds of uh, best emotional experiences that human life can, can offer. Okay, so re reason, emotions, we might come up with other things that we think are, are importantly here. But I'm going to pause just on, uh, on, on that at this point here and say, all right, suppose we then say, well, fine, I can understand both of these answers, and there is some truth to both of them, certainly. Reason is important to us as human beings. Our emotions are important to us as human beings. Uh, there are then some follow-up questions here. We might then say, all right, if we are rational beings and we are emotional beings, what's the relationship between these two? Is it the case that our rational life has a life of its own, or our emotional side also has a life of its own, and that these two proceed on independent tracks? Or is it the case that we think there's an intimate connection between reason and emotions? We say things, for example, like, love is blind. Right? That, I think, in, uh, is a somewhat metaphorical, but what we're saying is that love has a life of its own. The reason we fall in love with people is for reasons that are blind to us, or that we're not aware of the reasons why that we fall in love with people. So reason and thinking uh, and facts don't really have anything to do with it, and so that's then a position that says our emotional life and our rational life are somewhat separated for various reasons. Of course, there's also the other phenomenon that we might be very infatuated with someone, but as a result of coming to know the person, we gather various facts and, and, and the data presents it itself to us, we fall out of love with that person. We're no longer interested. In some cases, we might be repulsed by the mere thought of that person. Well, what's going on in that case? In that case, it doesn't seem that our emotional life has a life independent of our reason, but rather our emotional transformation is a result of our reason uh, coming up with and processing new facts and new data. So, is our reason and our emotion uh, integrated? Do they work together or do they, they do work separately? Now this, of course, is an important issue in psychology. It's an important issue in, in philosophy. But again, it's an issue that has important educational implication because if we want to say our job is to train human reason or to train human emotions, whether we think that those two are two separate entities, two separate animals that we are dealing with, or whether we think that they are integrated and should be taught in tandem with each other, that's going to dictate very different educational strategies when we're approaching just this one issue here. We might then say, uh, suppose there is a connection between the two, is it the case that, uh, uh, that reason really is the legislator here and our emotions follow along? Or is it the case that we think our emotions are our legislator and our reason right, is, the, is the tag along? Is it, for example, that we come to think, say, certain things about capital punishment, right? As an example, we form certain beliefs, and then as a result, we have certain emotions, uh, positive or negative, when we think about capital punishment. Or is it the case that we uh, come to have a strong feeling, a strong urge, right, a strong, uh, b belief or, or, or a strong felt experience when we think about capital punishment, and on the basis of that, we rationalize or construct arguments to, uh, to justify something that we've already made an emotional commitment to. Uh, does this one have priority, or does that one have priority? So again, when we're educators and we're teaching uh, things that are, are, are rationally important and, e and emotionally significant, uh, should we be approaching them primarily through the educational side, or sort of the emotional side of things, or through the, the rational side of things? Okay, so that's just to focus on two words here, a human being, and to raise then one question that's a philosophically charged question with important educational implications. Uh, suppose we come back to the question, we say, all right, what is it to be a human being? What's important? What's distinctive to our identity here? And we focus on issues other than these two important capacities that we have, the reason and the, the emotional capacity. Another thing I think is importantly distinctive about human beings and what we expect of human beings and what in part we are training human beings for is a certain kind of responsibility. When we are parents, when we are teachers, we want children to learn their responsibilities to become self-responsible adult human beings. 
And when we think about responsibility uh, in the human context, I think we just think about it distinctively compared to any other animal species. And this gives an importantly different cast to, uh, to human education. I use uh, uh, one of my dogs, right, as an example. We have a dog who's uh, fairly tall, has very long legs. He has some Great Dane in his background. And so he has the capacity to, uh, in the kitchen, just kind of go along and look over the kitchen counter without really straining his neck very much to see whether there's any food uh, of interest to him that he can steal. Now he's actually he's a good dog. We've taught him that uh, if there is food left on a table or food on the counter, it's off limits. And for the most part, he is uh, respectful of that. So one thing I can then say about our, our dog, his name is Hamlet for, for various reasons, is that he knows right, that he's not supposed to eat food that is on the table, right, so to speak. Okay, now suppose then I think I have trained Hamlet not to eat food that is on the table, and so I have a sandwich that I've made for my lunch, and I put it on the table, and I see Hamlet eyeing it, and I say, Hamlet, don't eat my sandwich, that's my sandwich, leave that one alone. And I leave the room, and I come back three minutes later, and the sandwich is gone, large surprise. So I look at Hamlet, and I say to him, bad dog. I use my, my stern voice, and his ears go back, and he slinks off because he knows right, that he's done something wrong, and he feels guilty. All right, so we hold him responsible, and we start then to use moral language right, in that case, and he seems to be evincing some sort of uh, guilty, uh, uh, shamed response in that particular case. Now, that might be true. But it would be different if we were to have a human being in the same sort of circumstance. Suppose my brother were visiting. My brother's a few years younger than I, but he's an adult human being. Suppose he were visiting, uh, and it's lunchtime, and I've made a sandwich for myself, and I put the sandwich on my table, or on, and uh, my brother is there, and I see him looking at it hungrily, and I say to him, uh, that's my sandwich. I feel welcome to make one for yourself, but please don't eat my sandwich. And then I go off. If I come back again in a few minutes and the sandwich is gone, right? and I look at my brother, and it's clear that he's the one who's, uh, who has eaten it, I will say to him, bad brother, right? and then hopefully he will feel some guilt or feel ashamed right, of what he's done here. But in this case, I'm going to hold my brother responsible for having eaten the sandwich in a way that's different than I'm going to hold my dog, Hamlet, right, responsible for, for being a Hamlet, for, for having eaten the sandwich, for example. We might hold both of them as re the responsible party, but we're not going to hold the dog morally responsible. We're not going to say that he's a bad dog in the sense of being an immoral dog. We hold him to a lesser standard. On the other hand, my brother, if he were to steal my sandwich in that particular case, we would be more likely to use morally charged language right, in his particular case. Now, so then here's the question. right? If we take that phenomenon as a real phenomenon, what does it say about our distinctive nature as human beings such that we're going to hold ourselves morally responsible? Right. For the good things that we, that we do, we should then be, be rewarded in various ways and get praise. For the bad things that we do, we should be held uh, responsible and uh, receive punishments or at least various condemnatory types of words and so on in a way that we don't hold other animal species responsible and won't praise or blame morally, right, so to speak. Well, one common answer to that is to say that we as human beings, unlike other animal species, are beings that have a capacity for making choices. Right? That is not the case that we do things uh, because we're pushed around by forces beyond our control. So we might say, for example, you can't really hold Hamlet the dog responsible for what he did because he's just a dog. He might be a smart dog and he might know right, that he's not supposed to eat the sandwich, but nonetheless, a dog is a dog. And if the dog is hungry, then there are certain biochemical things that are going on. He's feeling the hunger pangs. If there's a certain kind of stimulus in the environment, right, the smell of a sandwich right there on the table within his visual field, and I'm not in the room uh, as a countervailing uh, force to be feared. Uh, I'm out of the picture altogether. All we have then is strong hunger pangs, salivation in response to a tasty sandwich sitting there on the table. When those urges get strong enough, dogs being dogs, they necessarily are just going to eat the sandwich and that's just the way it is. So you can't blame them. They're just doing what their biological natures are dictating in the presence of certain kinds of environmental stimuli. 
It's not the same story that if we put a human being in the equation. We might say, my brother is visiting, he sees the sandwich, he might be a hungry guy, and so he's having the same hunger pangs, and we put it in the presence of the same environmental sim stimulus. There's a tasty sandwich sitting on the table there, he smells that, he starts to salivate. So he is subject to environmental uh, pr uh, pressures, subject to biochemical pressures, but nonetheless, there's another factor that's operative for him. He has the capacity of choice. He has the capacity to override those environmental stimuli, to override his biological urges, and to choose whether or not he's going to act on certain stimuli or, or not. And so what we then say is, since human beings have choices, they have some sort of volitional control over their thoughts, their behaviors, we can hold them responsible for how they choose to exercise that control. If they give in inappropriately, then we blame them. If they give in, but it's an appropriate context, then that's fine. And if they use their volitional control actively to bring uh, goodness into the world, then we will, we will praise them. So we can then make a claim that this is an important thing about human beings. Human beings are beings such that they have a capacity of choice, and that as adult human beings, uh, an important thing is to responsibly exercise choice over a vast range of things. And what this then implies for education is that moral education, teaching students responsibility in all of the areas of life that they're going to experience as adults, that should be front and center in our educational system. So moral education uh, of this caste becomes uh, central to, to what we're doing as professional educators. Now, of course, everything in contra is controversial, rather, in philosophy, including this particular claim. And uh, I suppose we're all familiar with the idea that uh, uh, there are many people who will deny that this claim is, is even true. They will say that this, this dichotomy I'm setting up between my dog Hamlet and my brother or between other species and human beings is a false dichotomy, that human beings are like any other animal species, not beings that have ultimately moral responsibility because they don't have volitional control over who they are. Instead, what they are is simply more complicated determined beings by forces right beyond their control. And so there are various uh, uh, philosophical and psychological and, and biological positions that will argue that in fact we do not have any choice, instead we have determinism as the truth about the human being, but the causal forces that are operating on human beings are more complicated than various other species, and they can give rise to this illusion, right, that we are beings that are making uh, morally responsible decisions. There are a number of varieties of determinism. We might make the argument that we are creatures of biology, right, that just like a dog or a hawk or a rabbit, uh, those species are all born with a certain genetic package that expresses itself as the species developed, but rabbits are going to grow up to be rabbits, hawks are going to grow up to be hawks, uh, and human beings then are just a more complicated developmental story biologically. Uh, we also know there's the position that human beings are products of their environment, uh, there the claim is that human beings, while they are complicated biological creatures, nonetheless uh, developmentally we're still uh, left with a lot of plasticity uh, in our makeup and depending on the social and environmental forces that we are exposed to, that plastic is shaped and molded in various ways until by the time you get an adult human being, the adult human being is primarily a, a product of his or her social environment. And there are certainly also theological versions that argue that there are divine forces, God or the gods, that ultimately wield the power and that uh, what goes on here in the human world uh, is already scripted for us and we are the puppets of the gods or of God and uh, just simply going through the motions that the, uh, the, the divine playwright or playwrights has already uh, written. Now, if we are then by contrast determinists right, of various sorts, that's going to give a very different uh, cast to our educational process. We're not then going to be primarily interested in internal motivation in the choices. We're not primarily going to be interested in moral responsibility. We're not going to be using languages of praise and blame because all of that kind of uh, vocabulary presupposes that the student has something to be praised for, right, or blamed for. Instead, we're going to simply see ourselves as 
complicated cultivators right, of a biological product, but that biological product already has an inbuilt biological destiny, or we're going to see ourselves as controllers of the environment and the student as a more passive being to be manipulated and shaped uh, as we, the teachers, um, think. Uh, should be done, or in stronger theological versions, we will argue that uh, what God wills will be done, and we are simply uh, uh, passively going along uh, uh, in that particular direction. Okay, now notice all of this is taking us into huge territory, and this is not uh, the end of it, but putting all of these kinds of questions in one box, uh, all of them are questions in one important branch of philosophy, that branch of philosophy being questions of human nature. And here we're trying to probe what it is to be a human being, right, fundamentally, essentially, right, most importantly. And that set of philosophical questions, right, none of, certainly those philosophical questions do also take us into questions of biology, they take us into questions of theology, and they do take us into questions of sociology uh, and psychology as well. But the philosophical component of them uh, uh, that we as teachers then have to address is going to be very important to how we answer the question of what our educational output is, and that then is in turn going to determine how we are going to structure this whole educational process. And we're not going to be able to do our educational process well unless we have a clear idea about what the output, and we're not going to have a clear idea about what the output is until we've addressed systematically these questions about human nature and made up our minds in an informed way what we think right, human nature fundamentally is. All right, that's one philosophical question that, as it bears on education. All right, let's go back to uh, this statement of our output goal here, an adult human being capable of functioning in the real world. We just looked uh, more closely at these two words here, what it is to be a human being. Now I want to pick on three other words and just focus on them and do the same sort of exercise to pull out some philosophical implications. We're going to pick, in this case, the last three words. We want those human beings to be able to go forth into the real world, to leave the relatively sheltered world of uh, their parents' home and, uh, and the school. All right, so what's the real world? When we say we're going to send students forth into reality, uh, what is that thing? Okay, <clears throat> lots of answers again possible here. But uh, suppose we said the following. We say, well, uh, in the real world, we know that there, is, uh, there are things like trees, and there are rivers, and um, there are rocks, which can hurt you if you bang your toe on them. There are uh, things like the weather. Um, there is, uh, looking more broadly afield, there are various planets. And beyond that, there are galaxies. So we start from our immediate environment here and, and scale out. Uh, we might also notice that uh, in our immediate environment there are other people right, besides ourselves that are part of the real world. Uh, they develop various kinds of uh, technologies. So there are refrigerators and automobiles. And when we go forth in the real world, we need to know about those things, um, computers. Uh, there are various kinds of institutions, school right, being an institution. There are legal institutions, business institutions, religious institutions, sporting institutions, right, and so forth. Okay, so we might then say, as one answer to the question, when we're preparing students for the real world, we want them to be knowledgeable about all of this and be able to navigate all of this. All right, so this then is reality. Okay, that's a lot of complicated stuff in there. Of course, when I ask, is that it? Is that the whole story, right, of reality? Is it the case that everything in here, this is uh, something we can put in a, under a broader heading, the natural world, people being a part of nature, trees and galaxies and so on being part of nature. And so what we're then doing as educators is telling a very complicated naturalistic story and preparing students for dealing with the complicated world, right, of nature. But end of story, right there. 
course, that uh, then immediately bumps us into a huge philosophical divide between those who say that is, in fact, the whole story. We can expand to the number of things that we include in this box here because nature is, uh, is, is uh, more expansive than this, this minimal list here. But one side of the divide is going to say just to focus on this is to miss at least half of the story and perhaps the more important part of the story because the truth of reality is that beyond nature, or above nature, or behind nature, is a more important reality that is not anything like this nature here. That in fact, there is a realm that is superior to nature. And so we will call that the supernatural realm. All right. And in that realm, instead of there being various sorts of complicated physical and material types of things, in the supernatural realm, what we have are beings that are spirits, or a single spirit if we're monotheistic, right? or souls, right? or minds, right? Right. and so forth. And that rather than operating according to various kinds of physical and mechanical laws, as this one does, this operates according to mental laws or laws of will or the laws of God or the gods, depending on the version right, that we exist. Okay, now. This is, of course, the uh, traditional question in, in philosophy of whether God really exists or the gods really exist. And depending on how you answer that question, you come down on one systematic side philosophically, a naturalistic side, or you come down on the side uh, more religiously and theologically, the supernaturalistic side. So, is it the case, really, that the important facts about reality are that there is a God, for example, that God created the natural world and governs the natural world. And so if we're properly going to educate students, then in addition to, or perhaps even more importantly than getting them into a right relationship with the natural world and being able to deal with it, is getting them into a right relationship with the supernatural world and putting them in a position to be able to deal with it. Now, if we answer the question that way, right, that then is going to take our educational system in one direction. By contrast, if we answer the question the other way, we say, look, there is the natural world, that's reality, but the realm of supernature doesn't exist. There are no ghosts, there are no spirits, there are no gods. All of that is uh, primitive uh, uh, belief that has been outmoded, say, in the modern world. And so we're doing our students a disservice if we teach them this stuff. We're interested in teaching reality, and so reality is the natural world, and that is what and only what our educational system should be about. Now this in philosophy is what we call an issue of metaphysics. When we were asking questions of what it is to be a human being, those were questions of human nature. This is a question of metaphysics. And this may be the first new piece of terminology that you're being introduced as you are you're listening in on this course. The term metaphysics comes from the Greek, uh, metaphusis, and the idea here is the, the phusis, what we now call physics, is to look at reality or, or the natural world and try to step back from it, that's the meta part, to try to step back from it and try to discern its general features or what underlying or fundamental truths can be said of all of reality, whatever it is that we take all of reality to be. And so the question then is, do we see reality essentially in uh, mono terms, that there's one reality, the natural world with all of its complexities, or is it the case that we should see the world metaphysically in dualistic terms, that there is a natural world, but uh, in addition to that, beyond that, and, and more importantly, there is a supernatural world and uh, we should then study both uh, of those realities. So, the educational implications of that are, of course, deep. Uh, one of the great battles in philosophical history and of certainly in educational philosophy, as long as we've been doing philosophy and educating other human beings, is this divide between those who take an essentially naturalistic approach to reality and those who take an essentially religious approach to reality. And having an informed opinion on that as a professional educator is absolutely a job requirement because that's going to have huge implications for almost everything that we do in our educational system. All right, cutting across this issue of whether we take the world to be naturalistic or supernaturalistic uh, fundamentally is another kind of question metaphysically. Uh, is the world such that we take it to be a world of cause and effect? That is to say that whatever happens in the world, there is an in principle understandable cause behind it. So that uh, there are cause and effect laws or cause and effect principles or laws of nature or laws of religion 
that are operative, and if we come to understand those, uh, those laws or those principles, that we can then in principle come to understand why everything that, that happens in the world happens, right? Everything happens not necessarily for a reason, a reason is a, a, a mentalistic right, kind of cause, but there is for any effect a cause that in, in principle is intelligible that we, through our reason, can figure out uh, if we come to have the right kind of understanding of the way the world works. That then means that in the future, to the extent that we understand the causal laws, we can make uh, uh, reasonable predictions about how things are going to play out and plan our lives accordingly, uh, if that is, is true. Now, by contrast, we could also make the argument or, or come to uh, the belief that, in fact, the world is not something that operates according to causal principles. Instead, there's a certain chaos right, that fundamentally uh, permeates reality. There can be naturalistic versions of the chaos arguing that ultimately the world is indeterministic or subject to randomness uh, and that, that our best understandings are always going to be inadequate because of this built-in randomness in the world. Or the uh, chaos can also be uh, in religious and supernaturalistic form if we believe that God is will uh, and God changes his mind uh, or that the ordinary uh, processes of, of, of reality that might appear to be causal can suddenly be uh, interjected uh, or interrupted rather by, by a miracle being interjected into the process. And so in principle, there is no way to understand why things happen. They do, those reasons are, are known by God alone. And then correspondingly, no way we can predict the, the future because miracles and various chaotic interjections are, are possible. So is it the case that supernaturalistically there's a cause for everything that occurs or naturalistically there's a cause for everything that occurs? Or is the world fundamentally a chaotic enterprise for naturalistic or, or supernaturalistic reasons. Now this has educational implications to the extent that we want to urge or not urge students to be able to come to comprehend the world in, uh, in universalistic terms, to always push for an explanation, always to have the explanation that they can plan out uh, the future of their lives and maybe take charge of their ultimate destinies. All of that is based on a presupposition that fundamentally the universe is causal. To the extent that we don't think the universal is causal, we're not going to make those very important educational goals. Uh, uh, instead, we're going to see our lives and the students' lives ultimately as being ruled by chaos uh, and unpredictability, and so the best we will do is then prepare the student for a fundamentally chaotic and unpredictable kind of life. All right, cutting across these issues as well, one more I want to put on the board here, one other kind of uh, metaphysical issue. When we think about the world as a whole, do we think of the world as a place that is hospitable to our needs our interests, our aspirations uh, for the world. And this uh, position is called the uh, benevolent universe premise. Is it the case that we can see the world such that if human beings do right, develop themselves, uh, uh, their capacities and so forth, they can go forth and find success right, in their chosen uh, realms of life? Or is it the case that by contrast, the world and the forces that govern in the world are hostile or inhospitable to human aspirations and so students should then be taught uh, a more defensive posture right with respect to the world i'm going to give you a couple of examples uh, historically speaking uh, to drive this point home here when i was in graduate school uh, for a couple of summers i worked in the library and uh, in the library department that i was working on there was a collection of old maps and I remember one month, very pleasantly, uh, my job was to take some of these old maps that were starting to decay and ship, uh, slip them rather between sheets of mylar and seal them up to uh, slow down the, uh, the decay process. And so I got to look, uh, look, uh, spend some time looking at a lot of maps, and that was kind of fun. Some of the old maps that were in the, in the collections and in the books that the library had were pre-Columbian maps, that is to say maps that had been drawn by European cartographers before Columbus crossed the Atlantic Ocean to, uh, to discover the new world. And uh, what was interesting about those maps for these purposes, and I'm not sure how many medieval maps fit this characterization, but there, I know there was a significant subgenre here, is that they, uh, the maps would typically have uh, you know, various uh, parts of Europe worked out pretty well. North Africa was pretty well known. Uh, things uh, uh, when you got to the Middle East also were, were fairly well blocked out. Things got a little less determinate as you got further to the Far East, into the Japans, India, uh, and China, although the Europeans at this time knew of those places' existence. 
What was interesting is if you went to the places that were the terra incognita, right, the, the unknown lands, right, so to speak, the uh, the Western Ocean, right, what we now call the Atlantic Ocean, uh, where uh, nobody had gone before, uh, at least as far as the Europeans knew uh, uh, in their their state of knowledge. And the interesting thing was that on many of these maps, there would be illustrations of the cartographers uh, that had put there. So they would have illustrations on the terra cognita, various features geographically that they knew existed. But the interesting thing was that in many of these maps on the, in the terra incognita, or the unknown sea uh, places, uh, they would have maps, or sort of little graphics or little icons depicting horrible things that would happen to ships and sailors if they went in that particular direction. So they would have, for example, a little tiny ship sailing over the edge of a huge waterfall, presumably uh, to, uh, to everybody's death and the destruction of the ship. Or in another part of the, uh, uh, of the ocean at the edge, they would have a giant fish with huge teeth right about to, uh, to, to attack and swallow up, presumably, again, a very tiny ship that was sailing along. Or a huge sea serpenty type of uh, monster that dwarfed the ship that was uh, encircling the, the ship and crushing it uh, in a coil, again, presumably destroying it. Now, the interesting thing about these maps is the projection of the world at large, and particularly the part of the world that the cartographers don't know about. There's an implicit metaphysical view, and I'm going to call it a malevolent right, view of the universe in this particular case. Because what's striking is that the cartographers at the edge of the map, where they didn't actually know what was there if you went off in that direction, didn't simply say, well, we don't know what's here, and so we're not going to put anything there. Uh, uh, or they didn't say, for example, that we, uh, we think or we hope that out there there are all these lush paradises and oases, and there's lots of beautiful women and maybe there's lots of gold and so they didn't put pictures of beautiful women or pots of gold or, or lush tropical oases uh, that the sailors could then find. Instead in their estimation what was real about the unknown world is hostile forces that are waiting to destroy you if you venture forth uh, uh, out into the unknown lands. Now there's an implication here that if, uh, if there is a safe, uh, the, the lands that we know and obviously there are lots of dangers and problems there, but the point is don't sail off into the unknown because going forth into the world, right, being the kind of world that it is, is a dangerous enterprise. Chances are very good that you will fail, you will be destroyed by various hostile forces of the universe. So stay close to home, stick with what you know, and insulate yourself from the hostile forces of, of the universe. Now I'm using that as an example of a malevolent right, approach to the universe. The idea being that the dominant forces of the world are negative and inhospitable to human design, to human interest, to human aspiration. Now think by contrast, another uh, fictional example here of the, uh, the, the television series Star Trek. And there's also been a series of movies uh, based on this. I've only seen a half a dozen or so episodes of Star Trek, but I am struck by the opening sequence which has, uh, my understanding this is the way Star Trek goes, is every episode is an adventure of precisely going forth into unknown parts of reality, uh, places that no, uh, no man has gone before, right, so to speak, and having all sorts of colorful, uh, uh, colorful uh, adventures. And the idea there is, of course, there's lots of danger and there are lots of uh, inhospitable forces out there, but there's lots of exciting stuff and interesting stuff and erotic stuff and wealth-making stuff. And if human beings right, are resourceful and intelligent and courageous, they can venture forth right, into the unknown world and have all kinds of exciting uh, adventures and live and survive and prosper for another day to go forth into further unknown worlds to, uh, to, uh, to have more adventures. And so if we think of the, uh, the, uh, the tagline of the show, split infinitive and all, to boldly go right, where no man has gone before, right, that idea that you're set toward reality, particularly the parts of the world that you don't know yet about, that you can have that attitude of going forth boldly and expecting to have great fun, great adventure, great excitement. Uh, that is a very different right, metaphysical attitude, and I'm going to call that a benevolent right, uh, universe right, approach. Now the implications here clearly are uh, significant for education. If we as teachers come to believe that the universe is largely a malevolent place, then 
the way we teach lots and lots of things, particularly value orientations and the kind of attitude toward the, the rest of their lives that we're going to inculcate in students is going to be very different than the kind of attitude that we will be uh, trying to inculcate in our students if we have a more benevolent universe. So this raises the question, is the universe such that we can and should prepare students to go forth and live their great adventures and dreams and, uh, and, and urge success upon them? Or is the universe such that we should teach students to lower their aspirations, to play it safe, uh, and hope to avoid the various dangerous forces that, if they stick their necks out, are going to damage them? Is the universe such that it's ruled by chaos, and so it's a, more of a matter of managing unpredictability? Or is it a matter of the universe being such that it is uh, causal and therefore predictable? And so, th therefore, long-range planning and strategy is something we should urge upon our, our, our uh, students. And again, is the case that the reality that we're preparing them for the very complicated natural reality, or is it the case that as complicated as the natural reality is, the more important and more complicated issues uh, lie in terms of one's relation to a supernatural reality? And so should our educational uh, content be primarily focused on the natural world, or should that be a secondary concern to supernatural focus? All right, those are some metaphysical issues that become absolutely essential to our figuring out what we're going to do in this educational production process if we're going to have students prepared as adults to take on the real world, whatever we take the real world to be. All right, I'm going to uh, go back to our initial uh, output statement here. We want adult human beings capable of functioning in the real world. We focused on human beings, uh, trying to figure out what it is to be a human being, raising lots of philosophical questions about human nature there. Focused on the three words, the real world, uh, raising metaphysical questions about what we take the real world to be. Now I want to focus on the remaining three words, these central words here, capable of functioning. Right? We want to develop in our students the capacities right, to function right, in certain ways when they are adults taking on the real world. This, of course, leads to some obvious questions here. What uh, capacities do the students have that we want to develop? We have lots of capacities. Uh, I have a capacity for axe murdering, right, for example, but presumably that's not one of the capacities that we want to develop. Uh, we have a capacity for doing philosophy when we are young, and that is a capacity that I think we should want to uh, develop in our students. What kind of functions uh, do adult human beings perform? What do they do with their lives? So we have to have some kind of a conception of what lifestyle or living or, 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 or acts of going through uh, ch achieving certain goals and doing certain things in life that we want adult human beings on average to be able to do. And that's going to require that certain capacities that they have be developed uh, to a point of proficiency so that they can perform those kinds of functions. So we can start then asking what are in adult human life some of the key functions right, that, we, uh, that we, we engage in? Well certainly one of them is uh, we want to have a career maybe a career as a philosophy professor, wouldn't that be great? Or a career in business, right, in banking, right, or a career as a teacher, right, or a career as an artist. And uh, as we know, particularly as we're into the 20th century, 21st century rather, one of the great beauties of our, uh, our, our civilization is that there are thousands and thousands of career opportunities that will be available to students, and if we don't like any of those career opportunities, we can go entrepreneurial and uh, make our own career opportunity. All right, so, but career is uh, one important functional part of life, but it's not uh, the whole of life. Uh, we also know that an important part of life is having friends. We also know that people will uh, have love lives and sex lives. Uh, typically, what happens as a result of that is people have right, family lives. We know that they also will engage in leisure activities such as traveling the world uh, and, and enjoying and learning various things there. There's the entire realm of art and literature uh, that uh, is an important part of, uh, of human life as well. So we can then start saying, okay, here are the things that constitute a life. Uh, what do we need to teach students so that they are capable of, of, of doing all of these things and doing them, doing them well? 
we uh, might focus on capacities. Some of the capacities involve knowledge traits. They might need to know what career options are available to them, what places in the world are, are uh, worth traveling to, knowing the various uh, kinds of artistic genres and media that are, that are out there. And then there are capacities that uh, have to be developed here. They, uh, there are certain skills that are going to be necessary uh, in career or in, uh, in, in literature, social skills and friendship, love and sex and family and so forth, all of that have to be developed as well. Another kinds of uh, capability are, are going to be various kinds of character traits. So we might focus on issues of the, the necessary uh, virtues that students are then going to have to acquire if they're going to be able to function well in all of these areas of their lives. For example, many of these things like career, friendships, uh, romantic relationships, family, right, and so forth are longer term projects and longer term commitments are necessary. So we might say that teaching students a certain amount of perseverance is, is a necessary character trait if they're going to be able to function capably, right, as, as adult human beings. And this then poses an education challenge for us because we know when we're starting with young people their attention span is necessarily quite limited but as they develop their attention span and their ability to focus and stay on task and, and, and visualize the longer term should be uh, should be increased and our job as teachers uh, certainly self-consciously has to be explicitly to build in lessons that, that, that build the character trait of perseverance for example uh, we might also say that uh, in careers and friendships and, and, and family relationships and so on on a certain kind of honesty right, is important. Uh, and uh, we know there are lots of temptations to lie, to fudge the truth, to, uh, to, to avoid unpleasantness. Uh, uh, can be prevalent at all stages of, of human life. So how do we uh, deal with uh, and inculcate in students the appropriate uh, attitudes to honesty and make that part of their character so that when they are functioning in all of these important areas of their lives, they have the requisite character skill, right? And so forth, right, all the way down the road. Now, all of these things are the subject matter of ethics, which is another important branch of philosophy. Here I have called these things functions, right, things that we do, but we do these things because we think they're valuable, we think they're important, that we think they're a significant part of what it is to live a, a full human life, uh, and to the extent that we do all of these things well, and uh, we're successful in all of those areas of our lives, we have a life that's a flourishing human life as opposed to a dysfunctional human life, uh, a life that's a happy right, uh, and self-realized human life as opposed to an unhappy uh, uh, an unrealized right human life. So here we can uh, substitute the concept of, uh, of uh, uh, or rather add the concept of values, right? And I've left it open-ended here with these ellipses here. What are the important values in life uh, such that we as educators are going to single these out? Obviously we can't teach every value that's possible to human beings, but what are the major categories? What things are we going to emphasize? Are we going to emphasize art as a value, social skills as a value, career preparation right, as, a tra as a value, right, and so forth. And how are we going to prioritize those values and how are we going to build them into our curriculum at what particular points. Certainly there are going to be developmental issues, friendship right from the beginning, love and sex issues though don't come along until later in the process after puberty. Uh, and so forth. So there are lots of questions about what the right values are and how to operationalize them and build them into our, our curriculum. If we're going to focus on character education here, here we're talking about virtues. Right? What are good traits to the extent that human beings, uh, uh, their personalities and their characters are not uh, hardened already by the time they, they come to school. There's a certain plasticity and a developmentalism that's possible there. Uh, how do we uh, 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 make real uh, and motivate and, and operationalize lessons that are going to build the appropriate virtue traits? Uh, and again, I have an open-ended list here because there are any number of virtues that can be put forth as candidates. Which ones are going to be the important ones that we will focus on and uh, build into our, our lesson plans here? All right, so far we have, uh, in this introductory unit on uh, philosophy of education, broken apart the phrase, first focusing on the phrase education, unpacking a little bit what is involved in that preliminary definition, 
Then when we started to explore in more detail what was built into the educational process, the idea uh, of preparing students for adult life, for dealing with the real world, having certain capacities and functionalities, we found ourselves led to big picture, complicated uh, philosophical issues. And so far, we've looked at three such categories of questions. Questions of human nature. Right? Are we in control of our destinies or, or, or not? We are re rational beings, we are emotional beings, what is the relationship between those two, and so forth. Questions of metaphysics, are we living in a causal world or a chaotic world? Is there a god or is the natural re world the, the, the entire reality? Is it a benevolent world or a malevolent, malevolent world, rather? Questions of ethics and the, uh, the meaning of life. What are the big values that we want uh, students to pursue as adult human beings? What should their career goals be, their family goals, right, and so forth, to the extent that we can help them uh, sort those issues out, give them the skills and knowledge uh, that's necessary? What kind of character traits are going to be important to our students as adults, right, and so on, and all of the questions of ethics that are, that are significant here. One other category of question uh, that's a philosophical question that's absolutely uh, uh, essential for educational practice, and I'll first give you the technical name for it here, and that is epistemology. Another possibly new piece of terminology to you. Uh, again, it's a, a Greek origin. We have the ology here part, which is to give an account of something. In this case, what we're giving in is an account of episteme, which is the, the Greek word for, for knowledge, or one of the Greek words for, for knowledge, right, of a certain sort here. And epistemological questions are fundamental to philosophy and education for philosophical reasons because if you take any question from any of the other uh, branches of philosophy here, I make a claim, for example, that God exists. There's a natural follow-up question, which is, how do you know right, that God exists? Right? Or if you don't believe in God, you come not to believe in the existence of God, what makes that a reasonable position to, uh, to, to adopt right, at a certain point here? So what we are asking in the case of epistemological questions are questions of knowledge. Right? What is it to know? Right. And if education is about anything, it is about knowledge. We are a knowledge-intensive species. We're a highly intelligent species, and to a large extent, how we function and flourish in the world is a, a result of, of, of the knowledge that we acquire or the, the, the knowledge that we don't acquire, which puts us uh, in a position for, for, for failure. So what is it really to know? What is it to know who we are as human beings? What is it to come to know the world that we are living in? What is it come to know what it is to be a good person and, and, and how to approach the achievement of various important values uh, in our lives here? And so questions of epistemology are important questions in, uh, in philosophy. Everything is controversial here from those who argue that we don't really know anything, who will adopt a more uh, skeptical, skeptical approach. Uh, if as educators we don't think that knowledge is possible, then certainly we're going to radically de-emphasize the importance of the transmission of knowledge and knowledge acquisition skills right, as, uh, as educators. But also uh, there is an important debate within epistemological circles among those and an applied uh, cognitive circles, implied uh, knowledge circles, between those who believe that knowledge is possible but have radically different approaches to the achievement uh, of knowledge. For example, if we tie epistemology to metaphysics, as it uh, often is, we can say one side of the metaphysical divide is between those who are very naturalistic in their view of reality. The world is the natural world, and so that's an important thing for us to, to come to know. But if the world is the natural reality, then how do we come to know that? It makes sense to say that, well, we have five sensory organs if we're born uh, normal and healthy, and it, uh, those are the basis of our knowledge. So we come to know the world through sense perception. We have a rational capacity that, uh, that we can use to classify our sensory perceptual data that can be formed go on to form abstract hypotheses, chains of cause and effect, theoretical understandings of the world. And so we might then make an argument that knowledge is something that should be based on the senses, that should be a matter of reasoning, uh, and maybe in the most 
complicated frontier uh, cutting edge parts of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge that we really come to know things as a result of, of doing science, right? If something gets through the, the scientific method, that is something that really can count as knowledge. Of course, if we have partial sensory data or our, our reasoning is inconclusive because we don't, we don't have uh, enough data to go upon, or if we're in the initial stages and we merely have hypotheses that we're kicking around and trying to sort out, we might have uh, terms that are, that are, that are not uh, as, as, as heavily fraught as saying that we know what's going on. We might say that rather than our knowledge being uh, definitive, we have only probabilistic knowledge at this stage, or we have a number of possibilities right at this stage. And so an important then part of cognitive training will be teaching students how to make those more fine-grained judgments, being able to tell when they're dealing with something that's only a hypothesis or something that, that is a reasonable certainty or being able, in some cases, obviously, to dismiss certain things as just as ridiculous and not worth spending one's time on. So developing our rational capacity in all of these areas then becomes a very important part of the project if we are more naturalistic right, in our metaphysics. Now, by contrast, if we are more religious, right, in our metaphysics, religious traditions typically do not emphasize the senses, reasoning, and science as the most important, or uh, in some cases not important at all, in coming to know the important truths about the world. If we are strongly religious, right, in our metaphysics, and we say that uh, the, the, the world of religion, the world of God, is a world completely other than the natural, physical world around us, then more nature-based methods of coming to know God are not going to be appropriate here. We might then say that really the best kind of knowledge, the important kind of knowledge that uh, we need to come to acquire is knowledge that comes through revelation. Right? Revelation that is communicated to particular prophets uh, through various kinds of mystical experiences that they might have. Uh, or it might be the case that these revelations we think are available to all human beings if they, uh, they, they use their, their cognitive capacities appropriately. Or it might be the case that we believe that the revelations are no longer ongoing but rather come down to us in the forms of traditions scriptural traditions or institutional traditions, and it might be that we believe the important knowledge and beliefs that we as human beings should come to believe are, are articles of faith, and that we do not adopt them because we have scientific or rational evidence for them. We might even adopt them despite right, uh, uh, rational evidence and scientific data right, to, the, to the contrary. So there are long-standing debates in philosophical circles over what counts as knowledge, and uh, particularly on what we take to be the most important knowledge that human beings should be striving for, what capacities they have, or how they should go about forming the beliefs that they have on those most important matters uh, in life. Now, education, right, clearly the implications are huge depending on what kind of an epistemological approach uh, we adopt here. Do we think that there is something to faith? And so that fundamentally, you know, we're giving our students a, a large body of beliefs that we want them to accept, and we're going to urge them when they start asking things like, why should I believe this? We want to, to urge them to believe them as a matter of faith. Do we believe that students have mystical capacities, that they can experience various non-rational insights into the nature of a higher reality, and so do we think then that an important thing in our educational process is to develop students' um, mystical capacities? Or do we think that really that's not the right way to approach epistemology at all? Instead, if we really want to have knowledge, knowledge is something that comes as a result of using your senses, using observation, gathering data, reasoning our way through that data, and in the most complicated cases, uh, doing science. And so epistemologically, when we're teaching students not simply what we want them to, to know, but how they, uh, they then come, become to be uh, uh, knowledgeable people themselves, these are the traits and capacities that we're going to focus on rather than these uh, sets of capacities down here. All right, all of these kinds of questions right, put together are the traditional subject matter of philosophy. And on my reading philosophy, philosophy has four primary kinds of questions. So we can say this is a question of right, what's real? The epistemological question fundamentally is how do I know? The human nature question, who am I? And the ethics question, so what? Right? What's the point? What are the value implications of, of all of this? 
Well, do I come to have an understanding of the world, ourselves, particularly our, our identity as, as, as knowledgeable beings, our, our core cognitive capacities, and put them in the service of living what we take to be the best kind of life. That is the subject matter of philosophy. Philosophy was first systematically uh, done by Greeks. I think probably human beings have been doing and raising philosophical issues as long as there have been human beings. Uh, we being the kinds of beings that we are, but nonetheless, systematic, self-conscious, and a self-conscious conception of philosophy as a discipline is something that originated with the classical Greeks about 26 or 2700 years ago, and it comes then from two Greek roots. It's a compound word, philos, right, and sophia. A philos is someone who is a lover. Sophia is the goddess of wisdom. So the idea of being a philosopher then is to be someone who is a lover of wisdom. That is to say, someone who takes seriously and is passionate about the kinds of questions and coming up with the answers, the kind of, kind of answers a wise person right, would come up with on all of the important questions of, of the human condition. Now, philosophers are people who do this systematically and do it as a, as a matter of, uh, of professional practice or, or if they are, are amateurs, devote a significant amount of their life to it. Uh, as human beings, whether we are philosophers so conceived or not, it's important for us to be nonetheless philosophical. Because as human beings, all of us bump up against these questions and for us to live a fully human life, it is necessary for us to have thought these things through and to have some sort of an answer, hopefully consistent set of answers and hopefully a thought through set of answers to guide our lives as human beings. And certainly as professional educators, it's especially incumbent upon us, I think, then to be at least philosophical and then hence the importance of a course for professional teachers and of a course in philosophy of education. We are, uh, as teachers, telling parents to give us their most prized possessions, their children. I don't think there's a parent that I know for whom their children are not the most important thing in their lives. And we're saying to their parents, give us your children for a significant amount of your child's life and give us lots and lots of your money and we will undertake this incredibly important process of transforming them into adult human beings who are competent and capable of living the best kind of lives possible. The only way for us to do that is obviously to take education seriously as a profession. And we're all going to be specialists as teachers. We might be seventh grade social science teachers or high school coaches or kindergarten teachers or whatever. We all have to know our professional niche and to know it very well. But we can't approach our profession with our, our blinders on. We have to know the particular specialized focus that we are, are, are professionals at in the context of what's going on in the rest of the child's education at that point in his or her educational career. And we have to know what that stage has to do with the whole rest of the educational process. And that necessarily takes us to strategic questions about education and philosophical questions about education. So education is a profession. Yes, there's lots of detailed specialist knowledge that's necessary to be an excellent uh, teacher. Yes, but also equally essential is a philosophical perspective on what we are doing as educators. And the only way to do that is to spend a certain amount of time doing philosophy. And that's what this course is about.